running live chat. I am absolutely thrilled tonight to have as a guest Nikki Sphinx. Hello Nikki. Hello, hi. And uh, Nikki joins us fresh from running a lap and a half of the epic, notorious Barclay Marathons. And um, if you don't know Nikki already, she's done a double Bob Graham round and a double Ramsey round as well. So very experienced foul runner, very experienced in long distance. So delighted to have you with us tonight, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So just in case people um, haven't come across you before, Nikki. Um, can you just explain in a nutshell your background and when you came to running? Um, well, I was brought up on a small holding in Glossop and I used to run a little bit around the farm there, but I wasn't actually a runner. Um, and then, um, yeah, I didn't really run until I got to about 2001 and um, somebody was doing the Leeds Abbey Dash and I decided to do that with, with her. And then from there, I just carried on, carried on going, really, getting long, going longer and longer. That's fantastic. So, but you went, you sort of came onto the scene from, from nowhere. In 2011, you did the Bob Graham 24-hour record, um, 64 mountains in 23 hours and 15 minutes. And then you went on to do, to smash the ladies' Bob Graham record in 2012. Um, which was then since um, beaten by Jasmine Paris in 2016. And then you went for a double, the Bob Graham double, and then the Ramsey double. So um, quite, yeah, what, quite a significant uh, number of events there and challenges. Um, can, can you just explain what gave you the idea to do the Barclay Marathons? Um, well, I think of all... Ever since I did the Dragons back in 2012, that's when I first heard of the Barclay Marathons. I ran with two Americans, Big John and Little John. And Little John had done them a couple of times and done a couple of loops, I think. And he just said I'd be really suited to it. So all these years I've been thinking I, I wouldn't be able to get round because I, I looked into it and it's five laps of roughly 20 to 24 miles. Um, you've got a 60-hour like time limit the laps are really hard I mean you just you run either anti-clockwise or clockwise depending on what Laz decides and you've got 12 hours per loop to do each lap but they've also got about four and a half five thousand meters of climb in each loop so probably more than what you would get in the UK in a general fell race of that distance um so yeah and I just knew it was really tough and also it's it's all unmarked. You've got to navigate yourself, and then you've got to find however many books Lazar's hidden away out in the forest there. So overall, it's quite a tough challenge. Yeah, it definitely sounds a tough challenge. And for anybody who's watched that film on Netflix, The Barclay Marathon's The Race That Eats Its Young, you'll know how tough it is. Had you watched that film yourself, Nikki? Well, I don't subscribe to Netflix, so I had a look for it, and... I don't mind paying whatever six dollars for it, but then I thought, knowing me and technology, it won't work even if I buy it. So I haven't actually watched that film. I've watched numerous other films and podcasts and stuff, but not actually the Netflix documentary. Oh well, it's a really good one. If you if you ever want to come to my house, I've got Netflix, <laughs> so I will show you the film. It's really really good. But yeah, there's tons of stuff online about it now, and with Gary Robbins from the Ginger Runner going and doing it as well. There's lots of stuff out there now, and it's it's fast become like the epic thing to do. So um, George Moss, one of my patrons, he asks um, about the mystique around the entry process. He just wondered how you got in. Like, did you have to jump through any hoops or hurdles? Um, there, are, there was a lot of hoop jumping and hurdles. Um, it's all very secret, and it, it took a long time for me to find out how to enter. Um, so I've got to keep it secret as well. Um, so I can't really <laughs> say any more about it apart from that, really. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all part of the mystique. Okay, then. Yeah. The, okay, no problems. Well, George, if you're watching, you'll just have to wait and see and, and enter yourself. That, that's a good answer. I like that. So I'm just going to put a little picture up now. Um, there's a picture of you pre-race and you've got in your hand, it's, this is just a picture of Nikki in her kitchen here, and you've got a number plate in your hands. So what what's that about? Well, all the newcomers which are called who are called virgins to the Barclay have to bring a number plate from their country of or 
origin or where they're living, I think. So uh, that was my number plate. It came off a Land Rover that we bought years ago. And so. I, I just noticed it's got the word eat on it. Was that, like, did you buy that especially or is it just a happy coincidence? Um, well, it's actually meat. You just take out the 29 in the middle. Oh. Uh, we bought it from a, a chap that was a beef farmer. So that was the, um, yeah, that's what it spells out. Ah, oh, perfect. And am I right in thinking that you've got a cattle farm as well? Yeah, we've got a beef farm, yeah. Yeah. So you've been very busy since you've got back with all the, all the cows. And so, so um, I'm just going to put another picture up that now of you um, at the race. You look happy and ready ready to go there and you've got a different number plate there which is a Tennessee plate so um do you swap one then when you get there um I can't see the picture but I think you mean that's my actual race number oh that's seven? your race number yeah. okay it just looked like an American number plate yeah okay so you're there with it, yeah. your race number you're standing by the yellow gate y yeah yeah Okay. That'll be the one. Yeah, so yeah, I think I think you know the one that I mean, yeah. And um, so I was just wondering, um, you look like really lean, really ready to go there. What kind of training um, and preparation did you do, like both physically and mentally? Well, I, us I just carried on with the training that I've always been doing. So I went to Wales a lot with my dog, Wisp, and yeah, we went up a lot of hills, uh, very steep ones and usually ones without paths on them to try and emulate what we might find out in, in Tennessee. Um, I mean, mentally, it's just, I, knew, I know I can go for 55 hours or in a little bit more without sleep, so there was that to get around. And then there's also not knowing the route because you're not allowed, nobody knows the route until about three hours before the actual race. No, three hours, yeah, before... Well, three o'clock on the Saturday, he, he, he puts the race out, route out. So I, I had to approach it as if it was a bit more like an orienteering event, like a Saunders or an Om, really. Um, I, I had the map, but I didn't know where we were going on the map. <laughs> yeah, so a bit like one of those mountain marathons where, you know, like the vague area, but you have no yeah. idea before you get there. Well, that's, that's really interesting then. So what was it like when you got to the camp and things? Like, were there other Brits there? Like, did you have any friends there that you already knew? Uh, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to say who's <laughs> there now either. Because um, oh. there were a couple of Brits, but I don't know whether they've publicised that they were there. So I best not mention them. Um, Billy Reid did come up to me. With mess I knew he was in, and he's from Ireland. Uh, right. messaging each other and so yeah we had a few words before the start but basically we were just waiting for Laz's to open registration up and so there wasn't a lot to do um we, we were just pootling around the around the camp yeah and I heard that um James Elson from Centurion Running down south was there as well did you get to catch up with him at all no um I also heard he was there, but I didn't, no, I didn't bump into him at all. I think I was just down, because our little campsite was a little way from the start, so I think we were just, I was just down there getting ready. Yeah, and what's the atmosphere like at the start? Because um, you have to wait, don't you, until Laz, um, he lights a cigarette, does he? Or, and then does he blow the conch? Which way around is it that it all happens? How did it happen? He, he blows the conch an hour before the start of the race but he's got 12 hours in which he can do that so from about um from from like about 11 o'clock at night till midday the next day you're waiting to see when he's going to blow this conch but I went to bed at about nine um and I think the whole campsite did actually because it's a really loud sound so I think we'd hear it anyway so, yeah. uh, and actually, there were people up all night waiting for him to blow it, but he didn't actually blow it until um, about half eight the next morning. So I didn't really get a full night's sleep, but I was supposed to. Yeah, it doesn't sound very relaxing. Were you kind of was everyone kind of nervous at that time, or like what was the general atmosphere in the camp? 
Uh, everyone's really friendly, even if you don't you don't know ev everybody. But um, and especially I think in the in the ladies sort of showers and changing rooms because there aren't many women there at all. So we're all really hoping that um, we all do well. Um, so yeah, it was a friendly atmosphere and uh, yeah, it was it was it was interesting to see the gate because I've been read about it for so long. So yeah, I was excited to set off. Yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned about the women as well, because as we know, 15 people finished um, have finished in the last 13 years, and none of them have been women, so it's really nice that the women are sort of banding together and, and giving it giving it a go, because it'd be lovely to see one of you guys finish it soon. Yeah, it would. I mean, I think, I think we're growing in strength, and one day somebody, a woman will finish it, but we're just learning. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, yeah, you've got to give it a few goes, haven't you? Yeah. I wonder if there are any men who have turned up and just won it or, or completed it on their first go. None. No, they've all they've all done it on their second or th maybe third, I think. Go, I don't. Um, yeah. Yeah, so third time lucky for most people. So we yeah. need to wait until a woman. Because there, there was um, a lady called Sue Johnson. She, She's done the best for the women. In 2001, she did 66 miles, which is 106K. So she got over halfway by quite a substantial amount, but still wasn't enough for the 100 miles in 60 hours. Right, yeah. So yeah, she's the one to beat at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to put another picture up now, and it's it's you um, with your race number, and um, you are talking to Laz. Um, and I've got a question from John Gardner. Um, oh, oh no, it's Leanne P. Actually, Leanne P. says, "What is Laz like in real life? Are you allowed to tell us?" Um, he's really like courteous and. He's really nice. Um, uh, I was quite, not surprised, but it was nice to have a few like moments just talking to Laz without everybody. I mean, everybody was around, but you just get like five minutes as you're registering. Um, he 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 understood the number plate straight away, and he thought that was a good like um, name. Yeah, uh, yeah. So Did he you was tell him the story it. behind it. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I, I like meeting Laz. He was a nice, nice chap, and I think he he wishes everybody well that sets off. Um, yeah. Did he have any tips for you? No. <laughs> I bet he doesn't have any tips for anyone. No. <laughs> Brilliant. And so, so you're there all on the start line. Um, so now, uh, can you just give us a little flavour of, of what those laps are like then? What was it like when you first set off and, and you're into that undergrowth? I've got a picture here that I can put up to show people what the undergrowth is like. There's, it's a nice picture of you sort of um, with uh, some branches in front of the camera lens and you're sort of striding out with some poles and there's a couple of people behind you there. Yeah. Um. Well, initially we were on a bit a small path, a trail, and it was really hot. So I set off, and I was I thought the pace was a bit fast, really, for me. I've just overheating. I think the temperature was about twenty degrees um, C. It was about sixty degrees Fahrenheit. So I was a bit worried about that. I I was sweating quite a lot trying to keep up with somebody. But once we'd sort of got to the top of the first hill, we we then descended into yeah all the undergrowth and everyone just scattered and went all different ways down this hillside so I just um I was I was navigating with a compass but also just following Stephanie because <laughs> I knew she'd done it before and she seemed to have a good idea of where she was going and Billy was just behind me so uh, I think our plan was just to try and stick close to somebody who might know where the next book is and um and, th and then surprisingly, we just found that we were the same pace as Stephanie and another guy, Michael. So that's we just stayed together throughout the whole day. Um, and, yeah, I suppose it, it cooled down and got hot. And um, generally, yeah, generally it was quite hot, though, during that day. I was only in shorts and T-shirts. Um, and Billy was the same. He was sweating a lot. But I think that... Like Stephanie lives in Afghanistan, so she didn't think it was hot at all. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, because um, you and Stephanie were together quite a lot. Like, um, where is she from and, and what is she like? Yeah, she's Canadian, but she's living in um, Afghanistan. Um, and, yeah, she was she's just so positive and she just, she was, her navigation was really good. She talked to Michael. He'd done it before as well. So they, they talked a lot about where to go and where the books were. And um, me and Billy just felt, well, we, we tried to make helpful com comments and stuff, but they sort of ignored us a little bit, which is fine. <laughs> but they said it was fine for us because we kept, we apologised for, like, just basically following them. And they said, no, it's, it's absolutely fine. That's what happened to them when they were, like, virgins. So, um, but it did, it did felt very, really, really odd for me not to know where I was going or but by the time I was like trying to catch up with my navigation and getting the compass bearings or whatever they were already off so um yeah it was good yeah, yeah the first week was just really it was really good and towards the end um we were all talking about how long we, we were going to have in camp before we were going out again and we we all decided right we'd have 15 minutes and then we'll get back out because it was about half yeah, we'd been 11 and a half hours, so um, it was about half nine at night, yeah. Yeah, so that's 11 and a half hours, and so, because uh, I've heard that the terrain sort of rips you to shreds, doesn't it? What, like, what was it actually like? Can you compare it to anything, like, that we have in Britain? Is it like, you know, like, bramble bashing through a pine forest or something like that? Well, bramble bashing through brambles. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Which we don't do because if you see a big patch of brambles, you generally go around them. But uh, these are just cover the forest floor, so you have to go through them. They're not as tangly as brambles, but they're like brambles stood up on their ends. So yeah, I had bramble bashes on. I had orienteering gaiters on my 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 calves, which I was really glad of. But I didn't have anything on my thighs, and they got sort of ripped up quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, so bramble bashes are like for some for people who haven't worn them before. They're a bit like not like a hockey shin pad, but like a little bit of padding, aren't they? That you sort of it's like a gaiter with a little bit of padding on the front of the shin, so yeah. you can go through bash um, bash through the brambles. They're called bramble bashes. That, that sounds like, like a really of, good bit of yeah. gear. Like a a walking gaiter that you see walkers wearing, but made out of sort of lycra and um, yeah foam down the shins. So. Um, yeah, they don't. They're not as baggy as the uh, walking gaiters. They they're quite tight fitting. They're really good. Yeah, <laughs> I really recommend them. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so we should probably I, talk a little bit about your also gear. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, well, I'd worn the gaiters around here just through brambles, um, and yeah, I was impressed at them there. But out there, I think uh, I take. I bought two pairs in case. One pair got ripped up, but I just wore the same pair for the whole um, length of time I was out there. Yeah. Um, I'd also bought some, some outkit uh, cycling gloves because I'd seen that people were wearing like fingerless gloves that looked like cycling gloves, not like woolly gloves. And they were really good because sometimes you had to hang on to the trees as you were coming down the hillsides. Um, and also, if you got hold of some brambles to get them off you, you need, you know, it, they really protected your hands. Ah. So I was pleased with those. Another good tip. And I also saw that you were wearing um, these shoes, the Innovate. Um, these Graf are the Mud Claw 260 with the graphene grip that um, yeah. that I've also um, done a bit of a review on, which you helped out with. Thank you very much for that. And um, so, uh, what would were, were they a good choice for that kind of terrain? Well, all the videos that I'd seen and all the pictures showed some really, really steep, wet descents. Um, the first lap was actually quite dry, but I was still, especially on the descents, I was way faster than the people wearing trail shoes. And um, I, I didn't get any blisters or anything. For the whole, I wore the same shoes. I, I changed my socks um, at camp. But no, they were an excellent choice, especially on the second loop when it started raining. It, the it became really lethal. I mean, we weren't really, you couldn't use your poles running downhill because you were just basically like trying to grip onto the ground and then, yeah, running from tree to tree because you couldn't, you couldn't really break. Uh, the leaf mulch just got so wet that you just slid. Um, 
as soon as you tried breaking. So, um, yeah, no, the, the graphene, the grip, it, I've always been impressed with it and it, it really um, showed me how good it was out there. And I've got a question from Guy Greatrex here, another patron. Um, he says, um, it, was it how you imagined it or was it much harder? It was hotter than I imagined it, but apart from that, it was just about exactly how I imagined it. There was some little trails, um, very few tracks, um, and a lot of direct, like going on a bearing, straight up a hill or down a hill. Yeah, so I think a lot of it was just as I, I'd sort of pictured it in the, in pictures. Um, yeah. No, there wasn't really any surprises. The only surprise, yeah, the first day was the heat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that soon changed, didn't it? <laughs> we'll get on to that in a minute. And um, and just there was a question from John Gardner as well. I know you covered the navigation a little bit, but just how hard is the navigation on the Barclays? Well, it uh, you could get within about 100 metres of where the books were, I think, with decent navigation and a compass because you were basically heading... Up, to, up hills to the top of the hills or down hills to the bottom of the hills, stream um, junctions and things like that. But then when you were, if you hadn't got the right stream junction and then you started looking for the book, you'd be completely stuffed because you'd be in the wrong place and you wouldn't know that you were in the wrong place. So you really had to get on top of your, your navigation. There was nothing really, there's no landmarks because you're in the forest, so you can't really say... Oh, that's that hill over there, or because you can't see. Um, so yeah, I think it was. It, and I think that's what would. I didn't really do enough to, to, to get sleep deprivation and find out that how much harder the navigation is in when you, you're sleep deprived. I mean, we we did we did about myself at half nine, and I think we called it a day at about half two in the morning, half three maybe. Uh, I was back at camp about half five, so I think it took us about two hours to walk in. Laz gives you these watches that just tell tell an odd time, so you don't actually know what time it is. You don't know how long you've been out. You have to work it out in your head. So they're set at zero, so as soon as you set off, that's zero. So by the time you've been going, if you go over 12 hours, they just revert back to zero again. Really? So um, that's the time that you've got to do the lap in, the 12 hours? Yeah. Yeah, and then there's five laps to make the 60. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's done why I'm a bit confused at like what time we actually decided, right, we're, we're not, we're going to jack it in now and walk back to camp. I, I just know we got back to camp and it was about, it was six o'clock in the morning, I think. So, so the first time that you got back into camp, um, what, what did you do there? Um, just take us through what you did in the yeah. camp before going out on the second lap. Well, we had 15 minutes and I was starving because I'd eaten all my food that I'd taken out on the lap one. Um, so I just tucked into some beans, noodles, sausages, pasta, everything, tea, <laughs> coffee, as much as Fish I could. As well as, no, unfortunately, but as well as packing up the, my race vest so for the next loop with that much stuff or not well yeah a lot a lot of stuff to go out with as well um, and then I put some extra clothes in my rucksack and then I headed up to the gate so because I didn't want to miss Stephanie going out and she just she just got her number with Laz that's what I was doing when I'm talking to Laz I'm getting my second number ah uh, um, okay because you get because you the pages out of the book the first time round, you need to set a different number the second time round, so you get a different number, so you rip a different page number out of the books as you're going round. And which page number did you have to rip out? Um, I, I was 77 on the first loop, and I think, <laughs> and um, 119 on the second. And Stephanie was 117, so that actually made it quite easy because we just ripped two pages out handed each other the page that's handy mm. that is handy <laughs> that's great so uh, so you ran out of food well you saw that all your food on the first lap do you yeah. what did you take with you for those 11 and a half hours just just the usual things that i have in england a ton of bars brunch bars 
um, some noodles made up in a bag, some gels, some crisps, some, yeah, cheddars, lots of the usual stuff, really. I found it quite easy to eat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so all the usual things. And um, so, yeah, so then tell us about lap two then, because this then took on a completely different feeling, didn't it? Yeah, well, I'd put in, I'd, I was always carrying the, um, the Innovate Protect shell because you never quite know. So I drank that on the first lap, but I hadn't put it on at all. And I put in a, cup, a, a couple of thermals and my three quarters. Well, I'd already taken them, so I had those with me. And, and there was supposed to be some showers coming through. We'd looked at a few forecasts, and they were all going to just pass through within two or three hours. So I didn't really think anything of it. And it was still so warm that I went out in my T-shirt and my, my skirt again. Um, and then as we got halfway up that same first hill that we'd been up, we got into the fog. And I think we all like went, oh dear, because that's going to slow us down. And as we got to the top, it started raining. So I put on a layer um, and then my waterproof. And then we carried on going and everyone else put their waterproofs on. Um, we found the first book at the top of the hill. And then on that descent, we it was it, the rain changed the terrain completely straight away. Um, it wasn't so cold then but I think we realised as we were going down the hill we were going a lot slower because instead of running down which we had been during the day we, we just seemed to find all the rubbish ground to run down big rocks lots of fallen down trees to climb over um, streams that were now full that had been empty during the day and um, yeah so it took us a long time to get down there and by, when we got down to the bottom, I think we then put on all the clothes that we all had and our hats and gloves and all the rest of it and um, started trudging up the next climb. And then the wind, when we got up onto the ridge, I realised that we were all wet through by now and I just wished I'd put like ton, 10 tonnes more clothes in because um, I could hear the wind at the top and I thought, as soon as that gets me, I'm going to be really, I'm going to get cold. And that's, I think that's what happened. We all just got... I mean, Stephanie and me got more cold than Billy, um, but yeah, I think I was I was starting to my hands were starting to get really cold, and I was just I think on the climbs I could warm them up, but on the descents they just got cold again, um, especially with falling over and getting wet, wetter. And the, the showers kept stopping, and I kept thinking I was drying out, and then just another shower would come. And I think when it got to about midnight we all knew that, well, we all didn't know when the showers were going to pass or if they were going to pass. Um, and then we met this guy coming down towards us. We'd been out, we were about a third of the way around, and he was coming down towards us and he asked us if this was the way back to the camp. And, well, Stephanie said no, he'd have to go back up and then off the other side. <clears throat> um and I think then as we were climbing, we all just had that little thought that we could also just go back to camp because <laughs> if we carried on going, we were going further and further away from camp. Um, and it was sort of like two o'clock in the morning and, and we'd have a, still a long time in the dark. And we, were, we knew then that we weren't going to make it round in time because um, we'd been so long already just... We'd been finding the books and navigating okay, but just really slowly. I don't think we ran. We ran hardly at all. And I think that's why we were so cold. Um, I couldn't feel my hands. They were just completely numb. So I hadn't eaten any food. I'd eaten all my gels that I could open, but I couldn't get any of my bars out of my pockets. So, um, And actually, we started this chap that we met, the South African guy. He was actually on his first loop. He'd been out there for so long and just got to like book five on his first loop. Um, and he'd been lost for like five hours wow. on his own. So I think when he saw head torches, he just wanted some company. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, imagine. So you do you have you don't have to do each lap in the twelve hours then, even though your watch resets. You just you can do yeah, like you say do one in eleven hours, one in thirteen hours. You don't have to do um, the laps in twelve hours. It's really complicated. So if you want, if you you can do the fun run, which is what they call the three loops, 
in 40 hours. So you have to do each loop in 13 hours and 20 minutes, I think. Or you have to be out on the second loop in 13 hours. Um, but if you want to do the five loops, you have to do every, every loop in 12 hours. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's why you were like, okay, well, there's no point going out again. Um, you didn't think, oh, maybe we'll just do the fun run at that point. Well, that's what we we had discussed at one point when we realised we were going to be, if we continued on on loop two, we were going to be over time, but we decided we would continue on. But this was before we all got really cold. Yeah, yes. So mm -hmm. so it was the cold that stopped you. That How long were you out for in total, do you think, in um, number of hours? I think we got back to camp at like six o'clock in the morning so that would be from half nine so yeah 24 hours 20, 22 hours yeah yeah because I was trying to work it out because obviously you're really famous now for having done a double Bob Graham so you did the double Bob Graham that's like 84 miles with 84 sorry 132 miles with 84 mountains and you did that in 45 hours and 30 minutes and then obviously you've got the double Ramsey round which is 116 miles and that's 48 peaks in in just under 56 hours so you're no stranger to going out for a long time um but this one um it sounded much more epic as a as in ter terms of terrain and weather. Um, is there any way? I know it's really difficult, but is there any way you can compare your experience on the Barclay to the Bob Graham round? Not really, because the weather was. I mean, the weather. Yeah, the weather was just so different. The terrain's so different. I, I would say it's more like the Ramsey round. It's as tough as the Ramsey round, but then we also got the weather um sort of thrown in and and the brambles that you don't get on the Ramsey round you get some deep heather but that's about it so I think it's my experience I mean yeah my experience of the double Bob Graham it was really good weather and you could see where you're going even when it was dark <laughs> um so yeah I think the weather's just made it two completely different experiences really um yeah so the terrain's different, the weather's different. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah, so we've got some really interesting questions as well here. Um, there's Rachel Patricia. She's saying, what main points did you take from your first experience at the Barclay? Um, what would you do differently next time? That is assuming there will be a next time. I haven't even asked you that question yet. Well, there might be a next time, and I think it is to, to just, well, I maybe study the weather forecasts a lot more, but obviously just take some more clothes. But I know what will happen then. You'll take all the clothes and you'll just carry them all the way around, but maybe that's better than freezing to death when uh, you haven't got them. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. It might slow you down a bit, but, yeah, I suppose if the night time's going to be so different to the daytime, then, yeah, maybe maybe a good idea. Is there anything else that you, anything else like, or like tips you'd give to somebody else who wanted to try it for their first time? No, not really, because it, I think, I mean, I learned a lot when I was there. I learned a lot about where the books are and stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll know more. I'll be a veteran if I hit, if I get back in again and I'll be able to show somebody hopefully round like Stephanie did with me. Yeah. Um, that's good. And so I've just sort of preempted this question now from Sean Lockhart, who's saying, um, he said some really nice things actually. He says, um, Nikki is a legend, so proud of her achievements. I would love to know if she would consider con re returning for a second bash at the Barclay. So yeah, so you've, you've just said that you might. Um, yeah, can you expand upon that a little bit? Well, not really, because that's it's all down to Laz and the entry process as to whether I get back in again. Um, so yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. I'll I'll know what training to do now, um, and I can just carry on going as I am. Would you alter your training then, having been there now? Um, I don't think so. I might do some more 
more a sense. Um, but it, it, yeah, no, I think I think my legs were absolutely fine when we finished. I think we were all quite disappointed that our legs felt so good as they did actually as we were walking down. That but we were just completely frozen. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is a bit disappointing, isn't it, to be thwarted by something that's not your like your physical body and your training. Yeah, yeah, I wonder what would have happened if the weather was different. Yeah. It's always, well. Yeah, so maybe like next year the weather would be better. Maybe, or maybe it would just be re better prepared. Yeah, and better prepared for the weather. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can have the best gear in the world, but if it's not in your backpack, then <laughs> you can't use it. Um, and this is a question that I think you'll enjoy, actually. So Mark C on the live chat is saying, if you could have a Barclays kind of race in England, where would you run it? I would imagine it's Galloway. Because every every time you do an arm in Galloway, you end up bashing through forests, up and down forest rides and um, across areas where they've chopped the trees down and left a load of, like, brash there for you to crawl under and over so I think it would have to be Galloway yeah that sounds good <laughs> maybe we should suggest it <laughs> um and then we've got a really nice um a lovely message here from Ruth Ellis. There's loads of really great messages on the, on the live chat here coming through, um, just so that you know that loads of people are watching. We've, we had 90 people watching a minute ago. We're on 83 now, so really, really popular broadcast. Thank you. And um, Ruth Ellis says, Nikki, you are brilliant. I love your attitude towards life. Keep being who you are. Um, lots of people saying thumbs up to that as well. Um, and then we have... Um, uh, Robert Montgomery saying he watched the documentary on on um, on you and he said it's absolutely incredible what you've achieved um, and um, and then we've got a, a good question here from Ruth actually she says how much mental effort did it take for you knowing that you weren't going to finish because you've been really successful in the past um yeah it didn't take any mental effort at all really <laughs> So you just get so cool cool with you stuff just get like so cool that I wanted to carry on and if we'd been going any faster um then I would have carried on but it was just getting to that state where I knew that if we stopped for more than five minutes I was going to get hypothermic I was already shivering my hand, I couldn't feel my hands and Steph was the same so we were just getting to that sort of like bordering on dangerous so yeah we stopped <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, Sean Lockhart still has given you a crown <laughs> on the live chat. I think that means that he thinks you're a legend or a queen <laughs> or something. Um, and this is a really interesting question, actually, from Kurt Steege. So he says, um, do you think that it's possible for a woman to finish? It has been said by Laz that he did not think so yet. Um, yeah, do you think it's possible for a woman to finish? I mean, it just it'll just be the right one and the right weather and the right conditions, and probably on their second or third go. Um, yeah. Uh, do you know if there are any women that have had um, a three goes? I think, um, yeah, but I can't remember her name at the moment. It was a yeah. while ago. Yeah, but the number of men that take part compared to the women that take part, yeah, there's definitely more odds of men finishing yeah. than men just because there are so many more. So we need to get the ladies out there. Um, and um, the other thing, uh, yeah, so Rachel Patricia, um, she says she'll wait patiently for next year and also fingers crossed for Gary Robbins as well, that he will be back too. And so she says, Nikki, you can just follow him. <laughs> So that'd be a good option, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Did you meet Gary when you were out there? No, because he wasn't there this year. I think he, I don't know if he's injured oh. or just yeah. I think I read earlier in the year that he was maybe injured. Yeah. So he wasn't there. Yeah. Oh yeah. I should have known that. Yeah. I think I remember that. 
Um, so there's some other people um, who are suggesting other ladies who might be able to win something like this. So Guy Greatrex is suggesting Holly Page, um, Leanne P is suggesting Amelia Boone maybe, because I know she had to drop out, didn't she? Yeah. Due to injury. So there's loads of badass ladies out there. Um, so they just need to keep going, don't we? And we'll get someone over the line. And um, so the other thing that I wanted to just touch on um, with you tonight, Nikki, is that you are 51 now, which is really good. Like, how do you feel being such an inspiration throughout your 40s and now in your 50, 50s, inspiring women like yourself in their prime? Um, well, you just get on with it, really. I mean, I'm 51. I'm about uh, two weeks off being 52. There's nothing you can do to stop getting older. So, And it's not stopping me from doing what I want to do. So I carry on doing it. Yeah, you're just achieving such great things and just going for it. And I think a lot of people just think to themselves, oh, you know, once I get to a certain age, then I'll slow down. But it just hasn't happened like that. You've, If anything, you've gone from strength to strength. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you put that down to? Is it anything particular that you do? Like, what's your secret? No, I haven't got any um, secrets. I just, I, I train, I rest, I recover, I listen to my body, and that's about it, really. Good sage advice. Keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and of course, as well, um, do you mind if we just cover the fact that you're a breast cancer survivor as well? Uh, yeah. That's really inspiring. So do you take anything from that t time in your life? Does that spur you on? Does that give you certain strength in this type of thing? Well, it, it did do when I had, had the cancer, which was in 2006. Um, I'm just getting on with my life now, and I'm enjoying every year as it comes, and every day, and every week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, having breast cancer was hard when it happened, and I still like to raise money for the, for the charity, for Odyssey. Um, but, yeah, I'm looking forward to sort of more years <laughs> out running. Fantastic. Um, so just coming back to the Barclay again, um, if there was one thing that you wish you'd known before you went there and, and had a go, um, what would that be? Um, what the weather forecast was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I've researched it so well that it, there, there wasn't any surprises there. Um, I'd read a lot of blogs. There's a lot, a lot of information out there, really. And so, um, yeah, that was the only thing that caught caught me and the rest of us out when we were there. Uh, I mean, maybe we would we would have been timed out on that second loop because we were going so slowly, but we would have still completed another loop, and that's what I wish we were able to have done. Um, so next year, if you get in, then maybe the fun run, and then the year after that. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so. Um, so say somebody who's watching right now gets into Barclay next year, have you got a top tip for them if they've never done it before? Well, I think find somebody that you can run with that knows where they're going and, and run with them uh, and be nice to them all day, like I was to Stephanie. Yeah, so pay it, like, pay it forward. And then once you've yeah. done it, then you can show someone else around as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really nice atmosphere, isn't it? Because in most races, you're trying to shake people off, aren't you? Yeah. But no, it, that's what, what it's all about out there. They know you. They, they know people can navigate. I mean, Pavel Plonsi, he, he navigated his way around. He didn't run with anybody. Um, he found all the books. Um, but, yeah, it's just a lot easier on yourself. And I think you're keeping them company as well, so... I mean, Stephanie was really pleased that we wanted to go out with her again. So um, I think we were a team by the, by then. Yeah, so work together as a team. Yeah. yeah, and it's a shame about Pavel as well, isn't it? Because he had a fall, didn't he? And he had to yeah. 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 Did you speak to him about that at the camp or anything? Did you see him? Yeah, I think, I think a couple of days later, his, knee, his the swelling had gone down and he was walking about okay on it. Um so yeah, 
I was amazed I didn't come out without any in, like long term injuries. <laughs> the amount of times I fell over, and, uh, but yeah, sounds like you need like a bramble basher for your whole body just to, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or one of those sumo suits. <laughs> Um, fantastic. So I'm just going to read out some more lovely comments because we're having a lot of Nikki love just here. Um, so Leanne P says she loves how down to earth you are. Um, everyone's agreeing with that as well. And then Ruth, Ruth Ellis has said that you are her role model. Um, she's almost 50 and because of ladies like you, she's doing two half marathons this year and trying to bag as many Wainwrights as she can. She says 50s is the new 40s. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so loads of love for you tonight. And um, so that we're just going to ask uh, the final patron question now, and that's from Guy Greaterex, um, who says, um, you've got royalty on your show tonight. L Nikki is a legend. Um, with your long and successful running career, Nikki, have you got any more challenges that you still want to do, either running-related or not? Um, well, there's, yeah, I can always find races to do. There's the Tour de Giants in September that I'm really looking forward to doing. I haven't done that distance before. It's 300 kilometres. Um, well, sort of non-stop, but I think I'll probably sleep somewhere. So, yeah, I've got, I'm, I'm excited about this summer and, and that. And then, um, well, who knows into 2020. <laughs> That's fantastic. So everyone can watch you um, doing the Tour de Gion, um this summer then. Um, so can you just let people know sort of how they can follow you over the coming months then, Nikki, like your social media or like are there going to be blog posts and things like that? Well, Innovate posts all the blogs that I, I put out. I've also got my own um, little website called runvg.co.uk and then I think people can find me on Facebook and Twitter and stuff. I, I'm not great at posting, um, but, yeah, when I do, it's usually important. Yes, exactly. Yeah, keep it simple and just a few posts, and then people will actually pay attention. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Well, um, we're going to uh, end the questions now, because um, I've asked Nikki all the questions from the patrons and everything on the live chat um, and there's just tons of people are now saying thank you um, John Gardner saying um, uh, he's just saying you just get on with it is as your secret to um, to getting to getting stuff done he just thinks that's a really good thing to say and um, everybody is saying thank you very much Nikki because it is just fantastic to hear it's just um, we have only just started hearing about the Bartley Marathon since the Netflix documentary came out in 2014. I know it wasn't on my radar before then. So it's great that we've now got a load of Brits going over and, and really getting involved because it's, it's one of those notorious epic things, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to let everyone know about the Bartley Marathons? No, I think that was it. Um... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, any any top tips for burgeoning Bob Grahamers? Um, not really. Get your training <laughs> done and recover. <laughs> yeah, just get out there in the hills. That's fantastic. So we've got Mark C saying, that was terrific. We've got Sean Lockhart saying, you're the best. <laughs> we've got George Moss saying, great interview. Thanks very much. And... Um, Loads of other comments besides that. Kurt's Deed saying, thanks so much, Claire and Nikki. Great show. That's fantastic, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to Nikki as well for spending some time with us here tonight. And um, there's loads more comments coming in now because they know that I'm going to end the broadcast. So we've got Leanne P saying, saying thanks, Nikki, and Claire in brackets. And um, Robert Montgomery saying, very inspiring woman. Thank you, guys. So how do all those comments make you feel then, Nikki? Uh, yeah, no, I'm really pleased that I'm, I'm hope, hopefully helping people to, to get out there and do something that they might want to do. Fantastic. Well, keep up the great work. We'll all be following you on the Tour de Jean. And, um, and good luck on the farm right now with all the cows at the moment in the spring. Thank you.
Fantastic. Okay, yeah. so bye everybody. I'm going to end the live broadcast now and um, I'll see you all next week for some more chat with uh, either a mystery guest or we'll do a gear test. So thanks everybody for watching and thank you very much for Nikki for the live broadcast. That's great. Fab, cool. So wow, we had nearly